What is up, guys? Welcome back to yet another trek through the Mushoko Tensei Jobless Reincarnation novel series. Happy Mushoko Mondays. We are on chapter 6 of volume 11. And yes, this, this episode we will get into a certain chapter, which was, yes, <laughs> very stomach dropping when I read the title, but it happened. I'm ready to talk about it. Hopefully we can get to it. I don't see chapter 6 going for very long, but... Yes, my plans for this particular episode is to go chapter 6 and chapter 7. There is a lot to talk about, and I'm super excited to talk about it. But as per usual, thank you guys so much for dropping by for the premieres. Welcome to the Mashuka Mondays. All those that support the channel monetarily, those that support with kind words, all that hit the like button, all that hit the like button, all that subscribe to the channel, all that stuff, your guys' support means so much to me, especially those that are members of the channel, so you can get some nice little uh, Mashoko Tensei emotes, and I greatly appreciate the support. We're trying to get past that barrier so that we can get more emotes, but it seems like we just keep doing this thing. <laughs> we can never get past it, but yes, either way, I appreciate people's support, no matter how you support. Uh, it means so much to me that you guys love this content, and I can keep bringing it to you guys. But with that said, Let's jump into this Mushoko Mondays with Chapter 6 of Volume 11, Life with the Grey Rat Sisters. After another month, the weather had finally warmed up. This is the second summer that Rudius would be spending in Ronoa. The changing season reminded him that he hadn't seen Badigati in some time. He keeps remembering that and is still bugging me to no end. I don't like this. Maybe he wandered off and forgot to tell anybody. Norn made friends with three girls and two boys. Rudius honestly wanted to meet them and invite them to come over to dinner sometime, but she flatly refused it. Rudius figured that she was probably too embarrassed. Thankfully, him barging into her classroom didn't cause her any problems. It would have if you <laughs> fired off that stone cannon. <laughs> Rudius and Norn were finally getting along though. She even asked him to be her tutor, which that seemed like a logical way of sort of bonding. I think that's something I mentioned a while back was there's a few theories that I had on this great way for the two of them to come together. One was through Rougeard and the other was him teaching her stuff. He's he's smart and he could easily teach. I mean, that's what Sylphie kept pointing out. Rudius explained this stuff so much better. Have Rudius train her. And it would be something that Norm would probably bring up in the idea that she's struggling and she wants to get better. Maybe to prove herself against Aisha or something. But yeah, he decided that he would teach her at the library at school. That way, Aisha didn't get too jealous. Norn was trying really hard to keep up, but struggling to put theories from her textbook into practice. Still, she wasn't as bad as Edis and Ghislaine. <laughs> at least he threw Ghislaine under the bus this time and not just Edis. With effort, she could end up average level in no time. Super normal. Super normal Norn. That's her new name, Normal Norn. As they were studying together one day, Norn spoke up. By the way, Rajir said that he was from the Babinos area, right? I know you were in the Demon Continent for a while, Rudius. Do you know where that is? Hmm. Not at the top of my head. I think he said it was close to Begoa region, maybe? I've never been there myself, though. They were able to have a casual conversation now. But it was mostly about Rajir, which is fine. <laughs> it seemed that Rajir was their common interest. Which, Rudius was happy to have someone else that he could talk to about Rajard with. Because he can probably... <laughs> Again, this is one of those things that doesn't dawn on me until I reread this. Probably because he can no longer... <laughs> he no longer is able to talk around <laughs> Sylphia about Rajard. I bet he's like consciously keeping all the conversation about Rajard away from Sylphie after that whole drunken stupor that she had. So, yes, this is finally an avenue for him to talk about how great Rajard is, because we all want to talk about how great Rajard is. After being inquired, he explained how the demon continent was full of big monsters. Culture was different, but has similarities to the region that they were in. Ordinary folks living ordinary lives. I really like that kind of concept because it is, let's no, make no mistake, Mashoko Tensei Jawas Reincarnation has hit on the concept of racisms and preconceived notions about other races. It's just something that's embedded in this world because of this long conflict that happened that has sort of created this divide between the humans and the demons. And yes, through our experience with Wizards Erd, we're seeing that prejudice very, very heavy. And yes, technically, rightly so, because Rajard was involved with this conflict of mass murder. <laughs> and it's kind of nice for Rudius here to sort of mention this idea of they're just normal people living normal lives, just like here. Being that he's kind of gone through a very unique experience that n pretty much nobody else in this world is sort of experienced, going through this entire travel across the continents, 
It has given him a different perspective on different races. And you could probably attribute that to the fact that he has this pre-knowledge of a life in a world where that's sort of frowned upon, despite the fact that, yes, Japan has its own issues. <laughs> Unfortunately, Norn still spoke overly polite. Despite him getting more informal with Aisha, he guessed it just felt more comfortable that way right now. They talked about the story of Rajur and the Spears, both hoping that Rajur would eventually realize his goals. With this in thought, Rudius realized it was time for him to finally kind of move forward with his idea about the figures and the books. This idea of creating figurines of Rajurd and bundling with a book that tells of this great adventure, the true stories of Rajurd. He was struggling to find time because his advanced healing classes and his intermediate detoxification classes. Though he wasn't sure what he was going to move on to next. Maybe gain saint level with fire and wind? Both of those seemed to involve dramatic manipulations of the climate rather than practical spells to use on a regular basis. It's kind of one of those things where you acknowledge that despite the fact that I can keep raising up and I could become this titled person, these aren't very useful in my opinion. I don't see any use for these. Instead, he could use that time to focus on writing his book about the Superds. However, putting pen to paper was hard. He wasn't sure if he'd go with the facts like a documentary or go with like a diary style. Possibly just move on to just doing a small booklet that's easy to consume. He wanted a simple, good versus evil story, with Laplace eventually revealed to being the true villain. Though, now that he realizes it, that probably won't go well on the demon continent, because yes, a lot of people on the demon continent seen Laplace as being sort of this hero. Cutting forward, one day, Norn inquired on what Rudius was working on. The problem at the time that he was having is that he didn't know where to start the story. And it was some time since he actually heard the stories. <laughs> the moment I read this, I'm like, wow, I wonder where this is going. Somebody just recently got a download of his whole story. Yes, Norn asked if she could help out. And an unexpected offer, but apparently Rajurd had a habit of putting Norn on his lap, patting her head, and telling stories about his past. Which, yes, made Rudius really, really jealous because Rajurd never put him on his lap and patted his head. Then he thought, no wait, let's be adults about this. <laughs> I would have wanted to get head pats from Rajurd. I, I feel Rudius right here. But yes, Rudius agreed to have Norn help. Of course, as long as it didn't conflict with her studies. He knows that Norn's writing was sort of childish at times, but reading it made him vividly remember Rajurd. Rudius teared up. You told him, you should have, you should have told him to hang out longer. You let Rajur get away. You couldn't say anything. And the more that Rudius read Norn's writing, the more he realized she had a talent for this. Now we're finally seeing the specialty of Norn. The thing that makes Norn special is writing. Now you can argue that this is sort of a conflict in the idea that it could be more in the idea that the stories themselves are so compelling that it's easy to write them back down. Creative writing and actually retelling a story is two different things. Now granted, it does take a certain skill to essentially write somebody else's story, but at the same time, manifesting it yourself is a whole different thing. I mean, I face that on a regular basis doing my videos. When I read some sort of article and I'm trying to put that into a video itself, I don't wanna copy and paste the content, so I gotta figure out some way of making it both entertaining and not just be reading from a script. Sorry, side tangent. For the moment, he focused on fixing minor mistakes that she made in clumsy sentences. He was basically the team editor now. <laughs> he felt it would probably turn out to be better than what he wrote himself. Shifting focus, while Norn and Aisha were still not on friendly terms, Aisha was superficially polite whenever Norn came over. Aisha was being careful not to insult her sister due to him scolding her. This concerned Rudius a little bit. And I kind of jumped on this as well. There is a little bit of a negative effect to having somebody essentially never express their real feelings. Either bottling them up or creating just this underneath disdain for somebody just because you're never allowed to say what you want to say. But yeah, Rudius thought he didn't want Aisha to feel like she couldn't express her real thoughts at all. He ended up giving Aisha permission to speak her mind. <laughs> he kind of questioned her like, do you, are you upset that I'm spending too much time with Norn? Um, do you feel attention starved? Uh, do you need a vacation? Or do you want to spend a whole day in bed? He confirmed with her that yes, he wanted her to be a little selfish around him. You know, be a child. <laughs> you run around being super made and it's like, every now and then I want you to kind of act like a kid, you know, have some sort of childhood, which I, I think is like the, the coolest thing right here. This whole segment, I think is what especially hits me is that, yeah, if, if for those that don't remember, Lilia, Lilia didn't want Aisha to have a childhood. 
And Aisha didn't like that at first. Aisha didn't like the fact that her mother was constantly pounding in her head all these routines and all these things that she needs to learn, how to clean, how to do dishes, how to do laundry, all these things was a focus. And even when Paul tried to like, you know, say, hey, can Aisha come over here? Let's have fun. She's, Lilia said, no, I'm going to raise her how I want to raise her. I'm going to raise her to serve Rudius. And it was kind of a sad thing when we started getting to Aisha's story early on was this idea that she hated that until she met Rudy and then realized, oh, I'm glad she did that because now I feel like I'm good enough for him. But there is still a sad side there that you're like, but this girl never had a childhood. She never got to have fun, enjoy her time. And so, like I said, this whole section here is kind of like, oh, she finally gets to have something. It's kind of sweet. But yeah, when he asked her to be selfish around him, she put her finger on her chin, tilting her head cute-like. With a mischievous smile, Ruiz's alarms went off. <laughs> Alert, abandon ship, <laughs> abandon ship, retreat. She replied that she wanted a salary. When Rudius and Sylphie kind of hammered out the details, Aisha ended up taking him down on his offer to a smaller figure. In the end, she was very mature for her age. He, like he's he's literally offering her like a large sum, <laughs> it's a salary. And she's like, eh, it's, it's okay, I don't need that much. After Rudius inquired Aisha on what she needed money for, she ended up roping him into a date, going out shopping together to discover what she wanted to buy. A date with his little sister. She'll find any excuse to roping him into a situation <laughs> that can involve a date or something. He was really fearing that Aisha wanted to buy some macho man slave, which he wasn't too fond with the idea of having one of those kind of standing around the house. I don't know why he would even think that she'd want that. At the general store, she picked out some flower pots. Aisha never struck Rudius as being the flower girl type. Again, because she's never had the opportunity to do what she wants to do. He'd assume that her hobbies were cleaning, counting money, and balancing budgets. Again, because she's never got the opportunity to. And again, I want to emphasize the fact that I really want to see Shiera and Aisha meet. <laughs> I think they would have been perfect together. Maybe there's a side story of their time in Milis where the two of them bumped heads with each other or something. I could just see them being like super good friends. But yeah, Rudius thought that growing plants was more of a slow, contemplative hobby. Letting nature take its course, and even a genius wasn't going to be 100% successful. Technically, you could. <laughs> there's a, there is a, there's a science to it. Ruth felt maybe that's what appealed to her. Being so used to manipulating things to her liking, maybe she wanted something that she couldn't control. Which I thought this was kind of a weird, a weird tangent that Rudy's going into. I don't know if that's something that they'll confirm later, but it's like, what? <laughs> what? She's like, man, I control everything. I would really like something that I just can't control. When Rudy's inquired her on getting potting soil, because obviously this place is just nothing but snow and dead dirt. She asked Rudius to create some with his earth magic, hitting him with the pleading eyes. It's got power. Rudius, of course, only had one response to this. Of course. Rudius was curious if she was going to get any seeds, and she mentioned the fact that on their way traveling all the way up the north, she was actually gathering seeds along the way. Again, this is kind of, I think the moment that she broke away from Lilia down at the Eastport, that was at that moment that she became her own person. I mean, <laughs> Nora mentioned it herself. The moment they left Paul and Lilia and started on their journey with Rizard, Aisha dropped the good girl act. She dropped her facade. She didn't have to have that facade around Rizard and Ginger and Norn. And I think that was the point which she finally kind of went, now I can finally be who I want to be. I'm going to, you know, Kittlemaster, and Kittlemaster might possibly let me have some sort of freedom. I no longer, I, she basically left her master and left her her trainer, left her sensei, which was Lilia. She'd finally broken away from that and she was her own self at that point. I think that was the best point in her life. I'm finally ready, I'm in control, I have the skills, and now I'm heading to the person that I want to serve. And so along the way, she gets to be herself. No longer being the one sitting in Millis being said that she's some sort of stain on the family. She gets to finally be her own person. And in this, yes, we'll see that <laughs> that was part of it. She's always wanted this frilly stuff. She's always wanted cutesy stuff. It's just that she was never allowed to have it. So yeah, of course she's going to be gathering seeds and wondering what she can grow. When Rudy's kind of mentioned the idea that, well, those seeds that you gathered along the way, they might not work in this climate. But that didn't really concern her. I think she knows what she's doing. Again, she's smart. 
As they were heading out, Ruth ended up picking up some teardrop earrings for Sylphie before they left. Aisha expressed how lucky Sylphie was and that Rudius could spare her a bit of love when she wasn't around. With upturned eyes to Rudius, he only had one answer. Not happening. <laughs> the old man would beat me senseless. Darn. So dorky. I don't know why it's such a, it's such a trope chemistry, but it just works in this regard. I guess because there's so much story behind the characters, you just, you just enjoy seeing those trope moments. At the clothing store, Aisha picked out some pink curtains, then proceeded to haggle the clerk and even dropping Princess Ariel's name in the process. <laughs> I don't even think Aisha's met Princess Ariel yet. She just knows that Princess Ariel's, maybe Sylphie could have told Aisha, if you ever need help or something, or if you're ever in the stores, just drop Ariel's name and that'll give us a discount or something like that. Cause Aisha has gone to the market for them. I mean, Linnea and Persina has mentioned the idea that they ran into Aisha at the market and she smelt like Rudeus. So it's a chance that possibly Sylphie told Aisha, you know, you can drop Ariel's name if you need to, because I work for Ariel and if we need help or whatever. But it could also be the fact that Aisha knows that Rudeus knows Ariel. <laughs> so she's like, and Aisha could have gone to meet Ariel. I could see her doing that as well. Aisha goes around. I mean, she's, she went out and met all the neighbors. She knows all this etiquette that should exist. She knows how to create connections and create bonds with the people around because she knows that she's probably gonna need them eventually. It's still funny though. The price came down to exactly what she had. Reese didn't even need to step in. It was frightening how good she was with her money. Since she technically spent all of her money, Rudeus mentioned to her that she should save some of her money for unexpected expenses. Shoot, ever since the whole displacement incident, Rudeus has actually been stashing money in his clothes ever since then, which I kind of found funny because yeah, that's technically what Paul did. Now, Paul didn't do it because displacement incident. <laughs> He's just been doing that because you never know when something is bad is gonna happen. He's always kept money in his hilt. And again, he's always kept his hilt with him unless he was doing his business. So I like that there's something that Paul has done that Ruiz has kind of inadvertently picked up on. But yeah, that's where we find out that Aisha has always wanted cute things like this. But Lilia never allowed her. Lilia said that it was wrong to decorate based on personal taste. Thus, yes, Aisha would never be able to actually decorate a room or something because that's their masters. Aisha wasn't just clever, but good at playing on emotions. She asked him if he minded wrapping her arms around his waist and hitting him with those Bambi eyes. Again, that was only one answer. It's totally fine, Aisha. <laughs> Good thing he wasn't a creepy old man or anything. He might just kidnap her on the spot. You don't have to kidnap her. She's already yours, technically. <laughs> Weeks following this date, Aisha's room grew more girly. She seemed to like cute, tiny things, plants, dolls, and she even started embroidering charming designs on her apron. He began to be afraid that she'd evolve into a gyaru. <laughs> I could see it. Still, both his sisters were doing well. He was content. Nanahoshi was also back into her groove. The bottle from their last successful experiment was sitting on the windowsill with a single flower in it. A success that seemed to improve her trust in Rudeus. She began to be more clear about her plans. Again, like we mentioned before, she never explained anything to Rudeus and didn't want to divulge anything to him or any secrets because one was the fact that she didn't want to have any sort of bonds with anybody, but two, it was all about, I want to get this done and then I'll give you everything. Just focus on this thing. But yeah, there's also an aspect that, and we'll get more into it later on, this idea there's a lot of these theories that she doesn't want him to divulge to anybody else. And maybe she had fears of him doing that. But her step-by-step -step plan started as first, summon an inorganic object. Two, summon something composed of an inorganic matter. Three, summon a living thing, a plant or small animal. Four, summon a living thing that fits a certain specific criteria. Then finally, return a summoned living thing to its previous location. I'd argue that last one is difficult to confirm. <laughs> it's like, uh-huh, I'm following you. Okay, it makes sense. And then, Wait, how do you confirm that? So yes, because of this, their next goal was to summon an organic matter from the old world. She figured they could start with food. So yes, this finally kind of confirms what I was talking about in what, like three Mashrika Mondays ago. It was when we were talking about the whole summon circle that she had made printed out for him as a gift. And my whole theory there was like, I wonder if that's like just to summon bottles. <laughs> because my theory that I had to go with is that 
when she's crafting this summoning circle, it's sort of like, you know, she's putting data in there. And it's possible that, that data is like an actual, you know, a chemical compounds and structure of something. Like the biological framework of it that she's writing down. Like there's something in it that specifies something. Not necessarily that you're, you know, aiming the summoning portal at a spot and then whatever's there gets sucked into it. It's more of sort of telling what exactly you're wanting. And it gets a lot more interesting as we go along here. While the bottle wasn't entirely inorganic material, depending on how you define it, she wasn't concerned about it. It seemed her specific criteria was to ensure that she summoned something complex as a human being, and with pinpoint accuracy, as to not end up somewhere foreign. So her idea is that she wants to figure out, you know, placement and everything to get very precise exactly where she's going to summon from and return to so that she doesn't end up in, I don't know, Canada or something. <laughs> She was already capable of setting some conditions on what she wanted to summon, but it was fairly broad. Like technically when she's summoning, say a cat, she can get anything from a house cat to a panther. It's like, she's basically telling it, I want to summon feline. And so it can be any feline, but she wants to kind of get it to the point where it's so precise, she can specifically choose what cat she wants. I want my neighbor's cat, not just that breed, that cat. She ended up muttering about how defining conditions was tricky. That she'd have to go see the old man again at some point. Reese figures she was probably mentioning the old man, that authority of summoning magic. Does this guy know a lot about this? Uh, conditioning summoning? Well, let me elaborate a little bit. In this world, summoning magic is generally divided between fiend summoning and spirit summoning. Fiend summoning called forth specific monsters. You'd summon intelligent creatures using complex sets of magic circles and using compensation. This is what people generally thought about when they used the word summoning. Usually it meant summoning monsters encountered from the wild, but it was possible to summon legendary beasts believed to reside in other worlds. That's interesting. <laughs> this is the idea that it's not just like, okay, you'll summon that, that, that snake thing from the petrified forest. Like I'm gonna summon that thing here. It could be like, I don't know, another world that has hydras and you could just summon a hydra or Bigfoot. That's what happened to Bigfoot. He got summoned to this world. And what's kind of interesting is it's always kind of felt like this world itself has seen the idea of summoning from other worlds as being some oddity that nobody can really do. And that's always been technically in the respect of humans with souls, not necessarily monsters. So it's kind of putting the idea that monsters is more Flexible. But yeah, it wasn't limited to monsters. It was possible to target inanimate objects. Then Ahoshi produced the plastic bottle with what they could technically be categorized as a fiend summoning spell. There it is. So that's kind of the classification here. We're talking about fiend summoning, summoning monsters, and then establishing that you can also summon legendary monsters from other worlds, and now saying, oh, but it's also objects. This is all categorized under one type of summoning itself, this technique itself. And so with this in mind, Rudius realizes an option here. Knowing everything that we've just now learned, there is technically one thing that could really be a benefit to Rudius using this. And that's kind of been Rudius this whole time. You know, even though he's been learning a lot of other spells, he's always stuck to like stone cannon because he knows how quick and useful it is and how he can modify it. And now he's realized with this knowledge, if he can master this, anytime he needs to replace the holy relic, he can summon Roxy's Ponsu. Ponsu Just gone. <laughs> Insert Kanasuba <kind of> steel. <laughs> now, jumping into spirit summoning, this was a very different kind of technique. It involved creating artificial entities out of mana. So, Fiend, summon living thing. Spirit summoning, creating a living thing, basically. Not that it's living. Designing these spells was similar to programming in a way. Not how she warned Rudius to not discuss this part openly. Now here's the part where it's like absolutely hush-hush from this point on. Many believed that spirits are living things that reside in the barren world. And that this summoning was calling them to this one. So even implying that, oh, it's just code, that it's not a living entity that's from another, this barren world would be kind of a bad thing to bring up. And then a Hoshi being from another world would obviously have the perspective of, well, it's obvious that these aren't actually spirits from the barren world. They're just coded to look that way or act that way. You're starting to get into technically religion 
and poo-pooing the idea of the afterlife, I guess. I don't think they've ever actually mentioned what the barren world is, but I'm assuming the barren world would be an afterworld. Fiends were harder to control unless you had the programming chops to make complex code. You could essentially make one that could pass as a human. And yes, Nanahoshi had seen some at the old man's place. So not only is it saying that it's possible, but she's actually seen it. This guy knew how to program these things, which would make sense that she learned from him that these are just programmed. They're not actually fiends or spirits from another world. He actually knows how to do it. Nanahoshi then handed over the magic circle that she'd promised before. It was a summoning school for a lamplight spirit. A lamplight spirit was a simple thing that kind of floated with the summoner emitting a bright light. It could understand simple commands as well. It wasn't the most exciting spell Ruiz had learned. And honestly, he was expecting something a little more flashier as a reward. This magic circle is an original creation of the old man I kept talking about. Not even the Magician's Guild knows about it. Hearing that it is limited edition made him a little more excited. Yes, still at heart, he's Japanese. <laughs> Going out and buying limited edition box sets and stuff because they're just limited edition. But no, I think the moment that she kind of handed this over and Rhea sort of kind of poo-pooed it, I, I kind of in my mind went, I don't think it's gonna be what you think it is, Rudius. Again, we just mentioned this idea of spirit summoning and how it's essentially a coding process. And then if you code it really well, it could pass as a human. She had this sent off, created by the old man, as a gift to him. She's not gonna just send off to him to say, hey, can you create a basic lamplight and it just follow Rudius? And he's like, yeah, sure, it's really simple. I mean, Rudius even says that he had learned it. So even Rudius knows about it. I don't know if he knows how to use it, but but I think what it's kind of establishing here is that if she had gone through the process, the difficulty of having him do this, it's probably going to be a really, really well-programmed version of it. So I'm curious at the moment that he he's actually going to use this. It mentioned the idea later on about joking about, well, you can, if you want to, you can just have it printed. Just don't tell the old man um, and you can sell it to the Magician's Guild. Again, why would the Magician's Guild care about a lamplight spirit? Maybe it's because it's very specially crafted and specially programmed, a very useful version of it. I'll be curious to the moment that he actually finally uses it or if he leaves it behind later. Still, she ended up promising him something more impressive next time. It's obvious that she knew that he was not too pleased about her, at least excited about it. But yeah, she pressed her hands together in a pleading gesture. Nanahoshi mentions that he could technically use his earth magic to create a template design and then be able to mass produce these scrolls to sell them to the Magician's Guild. You're okay with me selling copies? Won't the guy who made it be upset? Trust me, he's got bigger things on his mind. I doubt he'd even care. If you do decide to sell them to the guild, make sure you mention my name. That should ensure they don't try to rip you off. Note here, he's got bigger things on his mind. Like he's, he's got a lot of things that he's working on. I guess it's, it, you could downplay it in the idea that he's the dude's like dealing with all this other stuff he's doing. Again, he's technically programming human-like <laughs> spirit things that he's summoning, who cares about a lamplight? But yeah, with that in mind, he filed that away as one of his potential money sources. He then asked her if there was a possibility that they could summon some useful stuff from their world. But she was keeping them to objects composed of single consistent substances. But yes, the range of possibilities was wide. So you're saying there's a chance? <laughs> with them summoning just a bottle and no cap or label, it may be possible to summon individual items and then piece them together, which is an interesting concept. Still, once again, Nanahoshi warned him to not pull too many things from the other world. If he wanted to take chances in messing with the laws of the universe, he'd have to do it once she was back home safely. She's like, if you're gonna do that and summon too much stuff and then <laughs> cause some sort of problem and destruction, wait till I'm out of here. Catching up with Zenoba, he had completed his red worm figurine. It looked cool while different from the one that he had seen, because this one had horns on its forehead. Giving it to Julie, she was happy with her present, holding it up and giving oohs and ahs. Her human tongue was getting better, now having Ginger correcting her slip-ups. Apparently Ginger was actually commuting to work. It seemed like she didn't want to take the nearby chambers that typically servants and slaves would live in. She claimed that it would be presumptuous if she did that. Reese ended up asking Ginger why she swore loyalty to Zenoba. It was simple as Zenoba's mother asked her personally to take care of him. That was it, which honestly shocked Rudius. <laughs> but yes, Rudius figured that it was a very serious business to swear an oath. I mean, Ginger is kind of a prime example of oaths in this world right now. I mean, yes, you do have like Luke and technically Sylphie never swore an oath to Ariel, but Luke is always there at her side. I kind of get a really good sense from Ginger of how 
focus she is on being at Zenova's side. Even when they separated, she went straight up there once she got everything kind of handled. And again, technically leaving her family behind. The Rudius did read in manga once that feudal society was composed of a few natural born sadists and a great number of masochists. Maybe Ginger fell into the second category. <laughs> it made sense, but probably not true. <laughs> no, don't put Ginger into your weird mangas, dude. Moving on to Cliff, he had finished his first prototype magical tool for suppressing the symptoms of Elise's curse. Essentially, it forces external mana to counteract the flow of internal mana. It's not enough to eliminate the curse, but it slows it down. The details were complex. A lot of it dealing with how to align the external mana with the frequency of the curse's mana in a specific way. In the end, he found a way to make her curse less severe. So again, this kind of goes back to the idea that it's not necessarily the idea of him taking it and it taps Elena Lace and it's like, you are cured. <laughs> It's more of a thing that she's going to have to kind of keep with herself that sort of, it's sort of like a, a radiation or something like that. It, it's just kind of there and it's constantly pulsing in radiation to push that mana and sort of disrupt it. Which again, sort of makes sense to everything that this writer has sort of built up to this point. Though I was kind of more hoping the idea that it would be sort of a absorption of that mana, but that mana probably still needs to exist there. Especially if, if she's obviously using her <laughs> mana for you know, her own combat. Which does make me wonder if later on, with what we'll get into later on with the story, with this device, will it technically affect her combat prowess? Because it is sort of disrupting her mana in a way, and that mana could be possibly used for combat. Though he does put it specifically that it's external mana with the frequency of the curse's mana. Not her mana, the curse's mana. So there, there's, it's kind of sort of laying it out as this idea that she has mana throughout her body, but then there's this cursed mana that's inside there. But again, this is technically a theory of Cliff's. There was two remaining problems. Cliff showed him the device. It was bulky, a loincloth of sorts, something that you would see on a sumo wrestler or an adult diaper. It didn't look good and, which was a rare case, apparently the two of them had fought over it. She was fine with wearing it, but Cliff hated the idea of making his girlfriend look ridiculous. There's two sides here. It, it, one side it's like, oh, Cliff loves her so much. He doesn't want to make her look bad. But then there's another side of me that almost thinks like it's partially fueled by Cliff's genius nature. I can't, d th this is the thing I created and it's going to make her look bad. That's, that's not my genius. I can make something that will make her look prettier. I can make something that won't affect her appearance. I think it's more of the first, obviously, but I think there's also an element of his pride getting in the way as well. I guess a better way of putting it is that his pride won't allow him to make her look bad, but there is also an element of love. Zenoba and Silent volunteered to help him out. They developed a plan to miniaturize it. And yes, along with that, he wants to improve its effectiveness. Cliff's goal was to make it no larger than an ordinary pair of Ponsu. The curse curing Ponsu. <laughs> I I like I just like can we acknowledge the fact that this is this whole journey of cliffs is to create this thing that will affect this curse. And my assumption this whole time was that it was gonna be like a necklace or something. Like here it is, I finally create it. Here, put it around her neck and tie it off. There it is. Oh, it's the gem, it's so beautiful. Thank you, Cliff. And this will help me. Thank you so much. I love you. Or, I don't know, like a, a bracelet. A ring. Yeah, typically it would be like a ring. And then you could have this whole Doki Doki moment where it's like, oh, Is that a marriage ring? This is a sign of my love. Because I'm fixing it. And yes, technically if it was an engagement ring, she'd always want to wear it. No. It ends up being made in the form of Ponsu. Like, <laughs> Cliff is this whole time trying to create underwear for her. <laughs> Is Cliff, is Cliff like a pervert or something? A closet pervert? Why? What? I, I guess the idea is that when he was crafting it, it had to be some sort of cloth. And he figured something that would be hidden away and it ended up turning into underwear. Really big underwear. Ruiz figured that if Cliff could pull this off, 
they can make a pair of gloves for Zenoba, which I had never really thought about that, but that's a really cool idea. Which yes, as he kind of points out here, this would give him the opportunity to be able to finally make the figurines that he wanted to make with his own hands, because that's a problem that Zenoba sort of has, is that he has too much strength and he keeps breaking things. He doesn't, he's not very dexterous with it. And yes, that would kind of also help him with this whole situation that we had here recently with Ginger. Something that might keep him from when he does lose his temper and attack somebody, unless he takes them off because he needs to, those will be that preventative to keep him in check, sort of. At least something that when he sorts of realize what he's doing, then he can decide, oh wait, I do need to do this. I thought it was really cool. I like the idea of, again, sort of helping out everybody that has these curses to at least sort of kind of bring their effects down. But yes, this gets to why Cliff asked Reese to come there and why he showed him this Ponsu. <laughs> the implement takes way too much mana to be practical. Until it's perfected, he needed Rudius to charge it up. <laughs> I I thought this was whole was like, <laughs> I, I thought that we were gonna get this idea that Cliff was like, okay, but I'm gonna have Ellen Lee wear them, but on a regular basis, I need you to come by and touch her bum and recharge it a little bit. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I need you to come by and just charge her to pins every now and then to make sure that she doesn't get thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be the thumbnail. Rudius has to charge Ellen Elise's Depends. <laughs> That's too long. But yeah, from that day on, Rudius started to help Cliff with his experiments. Incidentally, the device did nothing to make Ellen Elise less horny. <laughs> it... the... <laughs> I, I mean, we do have to technically clarify that. Yes, the curse isn't to make her horny. The curse is forcing her that she has to Yes, sleep with people, otherwise it can technically kill her. But yes, as she stated before, she's been fine with it because she is horny. Lately, Rudius felt life settling into a smooth and pleasant rhythm. Get the warning side to be up here. <laughs> warning. He woke, trained, ate breakfast, went to the university, stopped by to see Zenoba, then to Cliff, ate lunch, helped Nanahoshi, tutored Norn, went grocery shopping with Sylphie, was greeted at home by Aisha, took a bath with Sylphie, ate dinner together, practiced magic in the living room. After Aisha went to bed, he'd practice making babies and then fall asleep. While days went much the same, he felt like he was progressing further towards his goal. Maybe this was what happiness felt like. It wasn't something that he got much of in his first try at life. But assuming that Paul made it back safe in a year or so, things should only get better. Flag, 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 flag. <laughs> Chapter seven. The third turning point. Yes, it is finally here. The finally, the, I've been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> and like I said, it's not that I'm, I was looking forward to it. I'm just waiting for it. And I think that's everybody that reads Mushoku Tensei. You're always waiting for that next turning point because you know, they literally are a turning point for the story. The story just shifts. The first turning point, teleportation to an unknown dangerous location. Second turning point, Literally dying, <laughs> literally dying, and just flipping the entire world on its head with the conversation with Man God. Everything shifts so much with turning points. I'll admit, this wasn't as shocking as I thought it was. <laughs> like, I had so much stuff going through my head right now. Like, holy crap, what's gonna happen? None of Hoshi's gonna cause a displacement incident. Um, or shit's gonna show up. Something crazy is going to happen, and my mind went a million directions. Oh, that's right, Body God, he's been missing this whole time. What if Bodyguardi was planning on something? What if he invades Renoa? What crazy thing could happen? It's shifting. Yes, it is a turning point. And I think that's a cool, I think that's a good thing here. I think I, I'm sort of happy with this turning point. It makes my stomach sink. This particular, what happens in this chapter made my stomach sink on multiple levels because it, it sort of finally confirms something not fully confirmed something, but it has established something that has literally been bugging me for a long, long time. And the amount of uncertainty it creates has my stomach turning, but it wasn't a direct happening. 
I guess that's the thing. With every turning point so far, it's always a something directly hits Rudeus. Something directly hits Rudeus. This is an emotional conflict that's created and something happening somewhere else that forces Rudeus to have an internal conflict. But it's not a physical thing, which I think that's the big difference here. Either way, again, acknowledging it is, in fact, a turning point. Because again, this is the thing that I've been waiting for for a long time is the, he's getting too comfortable. He's getting way too comfortable. Okay, this, is going, this has been going on for a long time now. He is getting extremely comfortable. Something is going to say eventually, Rudeus move. And this is finally here. But yes, chapter seven, the third turning point. Life comes at you fast sometimes. After returning home from training, he found Aisha and Sylphie with serious expressions on their faces. After some coasting from Aisha, Sylphie told Rudeus she was pregnant. His voice, hands, legs were trembling. This wasn't a dream, right? He pinched his cheek to make sure. Of course she would be. He was a man that could make things happen if he put his mind to it. Sylphie was anxious for his reply, but it was all sudden. He didn't think it would happen this quickly. Again, the, the thing that keeps saying is that she's an elf, so they don't get pregnant often. He stroked her belly. It may be his imagination, but he felt like he felt a bump. Right, our kid is in here. When he spoke those words, he felt a surge of emotion. He had to repress the urge to shout incoherently. He was going to be a dad. It didn't feel real, but it made him incredibly happy. But those words felt inadequate. Aisha snapped him into reality, asking if there was something he liked to say to his wife. He <laughs> is so funny because it's like well, there's a moment where he's like, he's so excited. He doesn't really know what to say. Like he mentioned earlier, he's incredibly happy, but that didn't feel like that was adequate enough. Like I have to say something, but I don't know really what to say to express the feelings that I'm having. And this, I guess is a good point to stop right here. I'm glad to finally get a sense of what Rudius thinks of with pregnancy. Because, and I think this is a, this is actually fitting to the situation because up until now, it's always been, I just wanna make a baby. I, I have to make a baby. I need this manifestation of my love for Sylphie. It's never really gave us a sense of Rudius in his mind going, I want to have a child because I want to do this. I want to train the child. I would love to have a son so I can train him to be an adventurer. I'd love to, you know, have a daughter so that I can teach her the wonders of the world itself. You know, talk about Nanahoshi and his experience with trying to help Nanahoshi, thinking I want to raise my own child so that I can teach them and never have them have the same feelings I have, like with Nanahoshi of wanting to distance themselves or with Nor and Aisha, you know, connecting those experiences with them to a daughter or connecting experiences with, you know, say Cliff to a son, you know, something that normally people, normal people would sort of want to talk, you know, think about with their desire to have a child. Like me personally, when I think about the idea of having a child, it's more to leave a legacy, raise a child and teach them the, the great, the things that I enjoy in the world and, and be excited for the moment that they choose their own things that they themselves want to experience and thus me shifting that mode of wanting to support them in that desire to chase their dreams, give them every tool possible to seek those dreams, you know, give them the, the money they need in order to go to college if they want to go to college or to train and do a hobby of their own. All those things go through most people's minds when they think of having a child. And yes, there's a large group of people that it's just kind of something that just happens and they're afraid of it, but then they experience it and that's what gives them the joy. But there's a lot of people that sort of plan it. And I think Reese is sort of falling in that first area. And that's was, that's been my assumption this whole time, that he's going to fall in that first area of somebody that doesn't fully understand what they're getting into, even though they're really trying to it. And still technically acknowledging the idea that most of that is that he just wants to keep banging. <laughs> And so I've always kind of felt a little disappointed in Rudeus in the idea that he doesn't necessarily fully plan that out. He's just jumping into it because he wants to have this thing with Sylphie. And it's kind of sad to think of that. And this is this moment where, again, it seems like this was all sort of in the idea of how he wanted to play Rudeus's mind out is that, okay, I've always wanted it because of this, but then when it finally happens, suddenly the emotion 
overwhelms him, and he doesn't really know what to say at the time. He is overjoyed. This is my kid inside of her belly, and the belly of the one that I love. So it's kind of cool in that regard, despite the fact that I've always kind of felt, what are you doing, Rudius? <laughs> what are you doing, Rudius? I guess because I've, I've had a lot of experience in my life with people that don't plan that. And then when it happens, it sort of destroys their relationship. And I think that most people, based, based on their own experiences and what they've sort of seen other people experience, sort of shapes their viewpoint on how children should be really handled. Rudius settled, after thinking for a while, of just thanking her. Thanking Sylphie. While puzzled, she smiled. He wondered if saying thank you was a wrong choice, but his only examples that he's ever had in his life was Paul saying something like, well done, or nice job. <laughs> he struggled again for the right words. I don't uh, think I know what to say. Sorry, Sylphie. He threw his arms around Sylphie rather than continuing. He resisted the urge of swinging her around, knowing that she was now carrying their baby. You did want a child pretty bad, didn't you? She wrapped her arms around him and patted him on the back. He peered into her eyes to not see the prettiest sight of himself with tears running down his cheeks. They kissed as he thought about how this was what love must feel like. Aisha then interrupted them as he was grabbing Sylphie's butt. <laughs> Aisha reminded him that he had to be careful with her for the time being, refraining from intercourse for the moment. <laughs> Which, yes, he realized as well, he'd have to control himself. Agreeing with Aisha, she offered her own services if he needed it. <laughs> She's just, like, on board with this. She's like, all right, time for me to step up. I gotta, I gotta step in there. This is what Lilia always told me about. But no, he flatly denied her to a pout. Besides the moral issues, he wasn't attracted to Aisha, which suited him. He didn't need to ruin his marriage by getting with his maid. Damn. Salt on wound for Paul. <laughs> I don't need to know what Paul did. Aisha then left to inform the princess, Ariel, in Rudius' stead. Aisha insisted that Rudius and Sylphie need to have some time alone. While they were alone, Rudius didn't even know where to begin. He thought about saying, I'll take responsibility, but they were married. It didn't make sense. Uh, Sylphie, I know this might be tough, but we'll do it together. Well, I think I'll be doing most of the work. Laughing softly, Sylphie laid her head on his lap. She wondered if he wanted a boy or a girl. A boy would be nice, an heir to the family, but he could pass everything down to a girl just as easily. I mean, in this world, there's no like, you can only be to a male. In his old life, he would end up saying a girl with a creepy grin. What a foolish man he used to be. I love this. This is very rare, but it happens every now and then. I mean, he's mentioned it in this world in regards to things like, well, I'm not my old virgin self anymore, so I'm not going to get all crazy with that. Very rarely do you have these moments where he acknowledges, I was dumb here, and I like this moment here. And I, I figured it would do that more often with things like Aisha, when he mentions the idea that he's not attracted to Aisha or Norn or Therese. Every now and then you get this hint where he himself acknowledges, this would be something I would do right here. But I'm not doing that because I'm different now. I've I've matured. I'm even though he keeps doing some really perverted stuff and thinking very perverted stuff, every now and then he kind of acknowledges himself, no, I'm different now. Like I'm not gonna like I mean technically it was a whole situation with the the beast folk when when they first freed them. He couldn't help but constantly think in a perverted way because they were obviously without clothes and he had to touch them. Now he's different. If he was in that situation again, he probably would act differently. Right now, he couldn't find a reason to prefer one or the other. As long as it was healthy, happy kid. Sylphie was relieved. She felt like she was finally Ruiz's wife now. Having kids was a major reason to be married in this world just like the last world. She must have been anxious about fulfilling that part. While Sylphie felt like Ruiz was going to have it tough because he wasn't going to be able to do it like before, he assured her that he would be just fine. Unlike certain old men that he could mention. Again, another <laughs> jab for... Paul, I'm wondering who else he's meaning with that whole regard. I guess Saros? In this conversation, obviously mentioned the idea that he might want to go sleep with somebody else. Rudius told Sylphie that she was free to kick him out if he did that. But she mentioned that she probably wouldn't be angry, just a little sad. I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> this surprised him. A bit mild of a reaction. He'd feel like crap if she went and cheated on him. Again, we sort of established this already from Sylphie's chapters. She's kind of figured him being a gray rat he would have a harem. And so she kind of prepared herself for that aspect that Rudius would need to do that. But at the same time, we've learned over time that there's also a major aspect of this that Sylphie just wants Rudius to be happy. 
And yes, we've already sort of been building here recently this idea that Sylphie feels very selfish in her requests of Bruteus. Having him there, her being focused on Ariel, and at the same time, feeling like she can have both of them when it feels sort of greedy. So what Rudius kind of mentioned in the previous chapter is this idea that it's almost like she's going out of her way to make sure that he's happy because of that. Again, kind of doing anything that he wants. After mentioning to her that he'd get really upset if she messed with another guy, she laughed softly and smiled. An expression she only wore around him. No one else got to see it, and it made him really happy. After Aisha returned with Norn in tow, Norn congratulated Sylphie. When Sylphie patted her on the head, that got Norn smiling. Norn loves the head pats. <laughs> Norn loves the head pats. We had lots of head pat Norn emotes in the last Mishuka Monday. Ruse figured Norn liked being patted on the head by the right person. Aisha apparently convinced everyone to wait before coming to congratulate. A reasonable choice she made on her own. Ariel also told Aisha that Sylphie would be taking two years off from guard duty. Ellen Elise had volunteered to assume guard in the meantime, which that's oops now, <laughs> which that's an oops now. And also Ariel would arrange for some time off from school. Aisha then laid out the entire schedule for everyone that would visit. <laughs> like, Ariel, Aisha walks in like freaking Shiera, like, okay, we're gonna have this schedule here and this one's gonna be here and this one's gonna be here. Aisha's great. She was like a personal secretary. After thanking her, Aisha turned to Norn with a prideful smirk. <laughs> Gotta get that in there. Gotta get that jab in there. Norn only met her gaze with a frown. Uh, they're get, they're, it seems like they're getting along a lot better now. The, before, I think they would get into a cat fight. It seemed like they were still squabbling, but that could be a sign of how close they were. As long as it didn't turn into a cold war, it should be fine. Again, he's sort of accepting the idea that he wants them to at least express stuff now. Don't keep it bottled in. They never said anything cruel when they fought, at least. Rius murmured that Paul was going to be shocked if he found out. These stupid flags, Rudius, stopped flagging. He's been flagging Paul for a while now. Norn's face lit up when he mentioned Paul. She really did love her dad. She'd probably put down marrying my dad on her dreams for the future. Keep doing it. I can't wait to see the look on his face. He's the type to spoil his grandkids rotten. So, I bet he'll be overjoyed. He was really sweet with you two when you were born. Aisha and Norn looked nonplussed for a moment. They had no memory of that, of course. Norn spoke up. Well, anyways, I'm really looking forward to it, Rudius. That put a smile on everyone's face. The life that Rudius had dreamed up back in Buena Village was finally close at hand. And it was so funny because I thought that that was turning point. <laughs> I literally thought turning point was just going to be... He has a baby, which yes, is a significant life-changing thing, like I've mentioned before, for people, is to having a child. But pregnancy, I don't see so much being a turning point in your life as much as the birth itself. I think there's a little bit difference in what exactly changes your life versus what just kind of signifies that a change is coming. Pregnancy is that it's coming. Birth is when your life actually changes. That's the point when you put your eyes on your new child. That's the point when everything is molded around that child and taking care of it. So when I was reading this, I'm like, please don't tell me that's it. I mean, that's huge. I mean, yes, it's obviously a big thing. It's huge for Rudius. He's overjoyed. But again, compared to being transported to the other side of the world and dying, basically, it wasn't much. And so I, <laughs> I actually messaged some people like, don't tell me just the pregnancy is turning point three. I mean, there's going to be something else in here. And then, yes. The thing that I think is on top of that, and I think it compounds it, is what comes up. Because now that we've officially established you have a child coming, it wasn't just simply, it's time to move again, Rudius. It's now, it's time to move and you're going to miss out on this very important thing. And it's going to create a much bigger struggle than what he would have had before. Because now, she's pregnant. So I believe both things are technically the turning point, is my point. But yes, the bad news arrived two months later. Rius received a letter dated six months ago. It was from Geese. And it was very brief. I'm having trouble rescuing Zenith. Requesting help. I knew this was coming. 
<laughs> I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. The only thing that gave me a little bit, like, this was literally back when we had the Paul letter. My stomach dropped because I was waiting for that. I was waiting for the moment that a, a letter would come saying things aren't going well. I just knew Ruius at some point was probably going to have to get involved with what was happening down there. I just didn't figure, I mean, yes, I could, I, another side of me seeing that it was going to be like maybe a volume pops up that is just literally the adventures of saving Zenith. And Rudius just stays up there the whole time. He doesn't technically need to get involved with everything as a character. This writer doesn't get Rudius involved with everything. I mean, the whole rescuing all the displaced, Paul handled all that pretty much. But I was waiting for this. I was waiting for that letter that said, Rudius, get down here. Things aren't going well. Because it kind of spelled it out with, with Ellen and Elise arriving there. It was just this moment where Ellen and Elise is telling Rudius, we found your mother, everything's fine. I'm like, no, <laughs> no. And then plus, like I said before, I'm sorry, they're flagging the hell out of Paul. They're flagging the hell out of this whole situation. Keep talking about, can't wait for Paul to get here. Can't wait for Paul to get here. He's gonna be so excited. Can't wait for Paul to get down here. Uh, Paul's gonna show up with everybody. And we're all gonna be happy family. It's flagging it too much. And I don't know, this writer has surprised me before. It's probably not gonna be that simple, but still, in chat, shush. But still, there is an element that I've been waiting for this moment to arrive. And now it finally happens. And I think the thing that scares me the most, and I hate geese for this, and the next time geese shows up, I, I, I used to love geese. But after this letter, no longer like him. A geese, you, him and Edis hanged out a little bit too long. I mean, that little travel they had together, geese learned something from Edis of n not explaining stuff enough. He literally just sent a letter having trouble rescuing Zenith, requesting help. And the thing that scares me the most is one, Geese sent it. Two, he doesn't mention anything but having trouble getting Zenith. Three, he needs help. That scares me because that tells me that Geese, Roxy, Paul, Talhand was not enough. Oh yeah, and also Lilia, sorry. <laughs> sorry Lilia's in there too. Those five aren't enough. What happened? That's what scares me. And the main key thing that I am stuck on, I am absolutely stuck on, again, chat. And again, I'm probably not gonna read the chat for this entire segment right here. Chat. Why didn't Paul send it? Now, Paul could just be knocked out. Rudius sort of makes a good point in the idea later on that, yeah, technically, Paul could have been so full of his own pride that he didn't want to ask Rudius, and so Geese did it for him. Technically, like Rudius mentions later on, Paul said in his letter, I'll take care of Zenith. You take care of everybody else up there. I'm sending all the money. I'm sending Norn and Aisha up there. You guys stay there. I'll handle it. So there could be an element of Paul just doesn't want to ask, but I'm still scared. <laughs> but I'm still scared. <laughs> I'm still scared. Anyways, I've been waiting for this. It's finally happened. My gut sunk, and I'll get into more aspects of this later on, but yeah, let's continue. The instant he seen those words, the world flashed white before his eyes. The man god didn't even wait. The man god's like, crap, gotta get in there. <laughs> gotta get in there, damn it. He found himself in a white space back in the foul person he used to be. So he hasn't shed that body yet. I'm I'm starting to build theories around that and I don't think I'm gonna get into it with this video, but I need to put a pin in that for later on. So Andrew, editing this video, put a note for later. He felt a surge of anger and resentment wash over him. In front of him was a smiling man god. Hey there. <laughs> I haven't used that voice in a while. What the hell's going on? What are you talking about? That letter, the one from Geese. He said the rescue isn't going well. What's the deal? Well. I expect it means the rescue isn't going well. What do you want from me? <laughs> but that's not what you told me. You said I'd regret it if I went to Begret Continent. What was that all about then? You, were you lying to me? No, of course not. You regret it if you went to Begret Continent. It was true back then, and it's still true now. Ah, now I see, I get it. I'll regret if I go to Begret Continent, but I'll also regret if I don't go. Is that what you mean? <laughs> he technically wasn't lying. You regret it both ways. Oh, I don't know about that. 
you weren't too unhappy with your life as of yesterday, were you? You made all those friends. You met many interesting people. And you did a lot of growing up. Your conditioning was cured. You made friends with your little sisters. You even got married. And now you've got a kid on the way. Yeah, my life's not bad right now. But that's not the point. You told me not to go to Begarette Continent. You tricked me. I really didn't though. Let me repeat myself one more time. If you go to the Begarette Continent, you will definitely regret it. What? But my family's in trouble. Tell me why, at least. Can't do that, I'm afraid. Damn it. I should have known better. You're always like this. You're being awfully harsh today. My advice has proven helpful, hasn't it? Maybe, but that doesn't change the fact that you misled me this time. Look, can you at least give me some details? What am I going to end up regretting? I can't make a decision unless I know the risks and the rewards. Most people have to make the decision blind, you know. You're awfully demanding. I don't care if I'm being unreasonable. I don't want to regret my choices. Well... If you actually think that though, a few of the consequences should be obvious. You had spent at least a year and a half as a student, right? And your sister spent a year traveling here. If you had gone to Begarit instead, you would have missed each other completely. What? But Paul sent my sisters because he seen my letter. If I hadn't written them, they would have stayed back in Millis or waited at Eastport. Not true. Even if he hadn't gotten your letter, Paul would have sent his kids to the kingdom of Asra. Lydia's family's there, remember? Sure, okay, I guess you're right. Things aren't so different now, really. Let's say you set on a journey tomorrow. What happens to Silphy and your kid? You're planning to leave her here, all alone, while you hike halfway across the world? Mmm, this, this keeps thickening. This keeps thickening. I really do think he wants to keep him there, and I think Silphy is his way of keeping him there. Um, that's technically a very broad assumption there, but it really does feel like he's super manipulative right now. And again, it all kind of compounds on itself. Like I said before, I really do feel like with the whole situation way back here, and it, it kind of mentions this again later with the whole situation with choosing to do what the man God says. And he points to the fact that he sent him to Sharon. And if he didn't go to Sharon, yeah, he wouldn't been able to save Lily and Aisha. But going to Sharon meant that he ended up staying there for a little bit and ended up running into Orsted. If he had gone straight to the refugee camp, he probably wouldn't have run into Orsted. And so everything sourced to kind of keep hitting on the same thing over and over again. For me, my big theory is, it's all about Nanahoshi. Go to Sharon. You'll save your sister and Lilia, and then you'll run into Nanahoshi. Go to Renoa. Enroll in the university to cure yourself, and then you'll meet Nanahoshi. Go to Begret, and you'll regret it, and you'll leave Nanahoshi. <laughs> keeps hitting Nanahoshi. But anyways, it's my big theory. So basically, I'll have regrets no matter what I do. Naturally, it's impossible to avoid having regrets, I'm afraid. If you go to Begrit, you're going to miss out on at least one golden opportunity. The way I see it, you're better off staying put. Well, if you're so sure about that, I guess I probably will end up regretting it. Fine. Well then, do you want to hear my advice? <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, sure. Can't hurt, I guess. Ahem. Rudius, remain in Renoa until the next mating season comes around. Linnea and Pristina will pursue you aggressively. Choose one of them and begin a relationship with her. This will bring you greater happiness in the end. What the hell? You, you tell me to cheat on my wife now? I'm happy with Sylphie. And those two are good friends, damn it. Suddenly, everything faded away. And Rudius woke up. The moment I read this, I'm like, here we are. This will be the first time Rudius will not do what the man God wants him to do. <laughs> this will be the first time I just don't see Rudius staying put. I don't see Rudius going after Linnea and Persena. He's dead set on being with Sylphie. That's good. He's being loyal to her. He's not betraying her. This has got to be the first time. And I really do feel upon reading this, the man god knows that. I really wonder what's going through the man god's mind right now because it's like he's telling him to do something knowing full well Rudius isn't going to do it. Yeah, you'll get with some beast folks. You'll be the super happy. He knows that's not going to work. He knows it's not going to keep him setting put. But I think the one thing that does still weigh in Rudius's mind from the man god is that he's stating just like back here and equally now. There's an added thing to this. It's not simply stay here get with a beast folk, you'll be happy. He also told Rudius, you'll regret it if you go to Begret now. Like then and now, if you go to Begret, you will regret it. He doesn't want Rudius to go there. And I, I'm curious 
why he even bothers. Because again, I think he knows it's not going to stop Rudius. You would figure if he does want to stop Rudius, he would do something more significant here. If you go there, Sylphie will die. Something like that. Something that will tell him. But I think I'm starting to believe that the man god won't purposely tell Rudius a lie. He does manipulate Rudius without the truth, but he never tells him a lie so far, seemingly. So my assumption is that he technically doesn't want to tell Rudius if you leave, Sylphie will die, because there's a chance that Rudius might still leave and then Sylphie doesn't die, and then Rudius will never trust him again. You told me that Sylphie would die. I didn't believe you. I went there anyways. Sylphie didn't die. I'm never going to trust you again. So it, it's, it's a big question mark for me right now. I was like, what, what is the man God doing right now? Why doesn't he want Rudius to leave? Why doesn't he want Rudius to get involved down there? Again, my, my main theory currently is the Nanahoshi theory, that he wants him to spend time with Nanahoshi. But in lieu of that, why doesn't he have a better option to push Rudius to stay there? Unless... This is a goal, but maybe not the full goal, and he actually does want Rudius to go down there. Simply wants to nudge Rudius in that direction. And he just had this opportunity right now to talk to Rudius, and so he took it. But yeah, like I said, I just, I just knew he wasn't going to get with Lenny on Persena. I'm like, this, it, it, that ain't going to happen. I don't know why, I'm just at this point, I, Rudius is, is happy with Sylphie. He's not going to cheat, which makes me believe. And this coupled with something that comes up later in the next chapter with El Nalise, if Rudius ever cheats on Sylphie... I'm going to be I'm gonna be like, dude, really? You passed up this opportunity, you passed up this opportunity, but this is your opportunity? Unless it's Roxy, I'll be fine with it. And chat, I don't need to know. Rudius woke up to Sylphie's concerned face. He assured her he was fine. He didn't know what happened after he read the letter, but with things going so smoothly, the shock must have hit him hard. Again, he got way too comfortable. The letter was alarming, but he had the word of the man god to consider. Yes, what if he went to Begret and along the way, they passed each other. What if, what if Paul and them are on the way back now? Again, it was sent a long time ago. Maybe Geese sent the letter in a panic. It wasn't from Paul. Was Geese helping rescue her as well? Paul never mentioned Geese in his letters. Again, because he technically hadn't run into him yet. <laughs> Geese, we knew, went to Begaret before Paul. And then Paul is arriving there now. Perhaps Geese had found Zenith on his own. It was six months ago, so there's a possibility that he sent the same letter to Paul, and then later met up with Paul. These were all possibilities, of course. He had no way of knowing the situation completely. Rudius also had his child to think about now. With such a long journey, he wouldn't be back home for at least a year. He couldn't just leave a pregnant wife alone to go on some adventure. This isn't to go on an adventure, Rudius. This is to save your family. <laughs> I know he's struggling here. As Sylphie asked about the letter, he couldn't bring himself to answer. He promised he wouldn't disappear again. It wouldn't technically be disappearing if he explained everything, but that was just semantics. Even if they talked or he left a thorough letter, don't stop. Don't pull an Edis. It would still be agonizing for her to be left behind. Uh, Rudius, you don't have to worry about me so much, okay? I've got Aisha to take care of me. She had a hint of anguish in her face. She's saying one thing, but she's obviously feeling something different. She's saying go, but she's hurting. She was anxious. She was pregnant. And it was her first time, obviously. Her belly got bigger day by day. And soon, she wouldn't be able to move on her own alone or walk upstairs. There was also a chance that Rudius would die on his journey, never coming back. She fought down fear to speak those words. After saying he wouldn't leave her, she smiled with a hint of confliction. It's like she's, ga she's getting what she technically feeling-wise wants, but at the same time... She doesn't want that. <laughs> it's like she wants that, but she doesn't want that. The words of the man god lingered in his mind. No matter what decision he made, he was going to regret it. Again, going back to what he said before, the man god saying, you will surely regret it. That's everything you can have regrets over. The next three days were long and difficult. Every time he seen Sylphie, Aisha, and Norn, they had anxious looks on their faces. He told them he wouldn't be going to the Begaret continent, but the more he thought, the more uncertain he felt. He was torn between two places. Asking Ellen Elise, she nodded. I think it's a wise choice, Rudius. You're better off staying behind for this one. Are you gonna go? Sylphie's my granddaughter, Rudius. It's only right that I take this job for her sake as much as yours. She apparently had received an identical letter. Unlike him, she was ready and willing to go. 
even if it meant leaving her life behind. Oof, I love Ellie so much. <laughs> it's like this element of... It's so weird. I, I find Paul's party so weird, and I can't wait to have some sort of side story where it just goes to their time together. And again, eventually learning why Elise hates Paul so much. But it's like, despite the fact that she constantly seems to hate Paul, they still are putting themselves in major danger to do all this stuff. Again, with Talhand and Elise and Geese, they have literally given up years of their life to help him find his family. Why? It shows so much it, it massive respect I have for these people and what they're doing to help Paul. It's a very selfless job they're doing here without hesitation. Dropping literally somebody that you assume is the love of her life. I mean, things are going really well with Cliff. And again, her pregnant granddaughter. Aren't you gardening Princess Ariel though? There's very little danger to her life while she's enrolled in the school. I wasn't doing much of anything, to be honest. That was probably true most of the time, though you never knew and when it might turn dangerous. But that was Ariel's decision. And Elise had basically volunteered as a goodwill gesture. He doubted Ariel objected to her backing out. Again, this is sort of hinting at the idea that either Ariel is feeling comfortable right now, or again, technically wants to put, in a sense, Sylphie first. Sylphie's husband's mother is in danger. What about Cliff? I'll have to leave him. He might hate me forever, but I don't have much choice. Why don't you at least explain the situation? I'm sure he'll understand. She shook her head with a melancholy smile. It didn't look like her usual smirk. Cliff's a pure-hearted young man. He has talent, drive, and vision. I wouldn't be surprised if he becomes a pope one day. He's better off remembering me as nothing more than a useful indiscretion. <laughs> this is the, the continued... Ella Elise that just completely belittled herself. Just, he'll be, f he'll be better off without me. I'm just this, this, this thing that he had a fling with. This thing that is, he deserves better, basically. And it's just a, mm. so it's almost like there's a part of this that almost feels like she's trying to just, looking for an excuse to walk away because she's only a burden on him. She's always felt that she's a burden everywhere. She's always destroyed everywhere she went. And I feel like there's a conflict here in the idea that she does, I think she knows Cliff is different, but at the same time, she's afraid of destroying that. Just like she feels she destroys everything. That made Rius feel terrible for Cliff. Members of the Mills church were expected to be remain loyal to a single person. If Ellen Lace disappears, it might shake the foundations of his faith. He's strong-willed, but it's hard to know what losing his religion might do to him. So besides just the relationship aspect of it, this could this could break him. And also, I'm the one who told you to stay here last time. That makes cleaning up this mess my responsibility, don't you think? <laughs> I was wondering when that was actually gonna come back. I was wondering when that was gonna come back because again, going all the way back to when Ellen Lace first met up with Rudius, she told him, they found your mom. Okay, let's go down there. And then he has the, the the whole thing with the man god. She's like, oh, just enroll. It's fine. Don't worry about them. They'll handle it. She told Rudius not to go. Told Rudius it would be fine. Go enroll. You're fine. Go have your life. So she is sort of feeling guilty for that. She was so firm and clear that he found a loss for words. Taking his silence as an agreement, she nodded. You just have to leave this to me and wait here, dear. I want to see a happy great-grandchild waiting for me when I make it back. Oh, I love Emily so much. <laughs> I love her so much. He realized that nothing he would say would change her mind. Next, he visited Zenoba. After hearing his story, Zenoba looked calmly. I see. Well, I'm sure you'll deal with this matter easily enough and come back before too long. I will remain here and continue my pursuit of the research. But I do hope you'll return as quickly as possible. I kind of thought you would ask me not to go or demand that I bring you with me. Yes, technically when he parted with him back in Sharon, he wept and clung on to him. But this time was different. Should you wish for me to accompany you, I would loathe to refuse, but I'm unaccustomed to lengthy journeys and I fear I may prove a burden. And of course, he glanced at Julie. I couldn't bring the girl on such a trip. He could leave her with Ginger, but that would put his studies and research on hold. Coming along would be dangerous. Do you think I should go, Zenoba? That is your decision to make, Master. He almost sounded dismissive. Reus was honestly hoping for some advice. 
Why would you expect to get anything out of Zanelba? Zanelba is going to be like, you you decide. <laughs> like, he's not the type of be like, all right, um, well, let's calculate everything. But I like this, though, because there's a few things sprinkled in here. One is, yes, the fact that he trusts Rudius is going to handle things. He just knows his master is that good. He's going to handle things, do it quickly. Everything's going to be fine. He has no, he has full faith in Rudius. Second thing here is acknowledging his own weaknesses. If he goes along, he will be a burden to Rudius. You're better off going without me. So he didn't even assume to go with him. I will only cause him problems. A third, Julie. He cares for the safety of Julie. <laughs> I love the fact that, again, we kind of established this way back here in this idea that he named Julie after the brother that he had unfortunately killed. And over time, he has grown a bond with Julie to the point now where he fears for her safety. And in a sense, is being mindful of her safety and the idea of almost a brotherly bond, putting her safety first, treating her with gentleness. However, may I make one observation? Hmm? The birth of a child does not require a father's presence. If you're worried about your parents, why not go to their aid? I will guarantee the safety of your wife and your children in your absence. He had conviction in his words. It made sense that royalty had a different perspective on this. I would, of course, prefer to have you at my side constantly, but the choice is yours. You make some decent points, Zenoba. Thanks for the advice. I like this. It's literally like, go. I'll handle your, I'll, I'll take care of your wife. Don't worry. Like, it, again, like Rudy's kind of mentions, royalty perspective is a little bit different in the idea that they, they sort of see a, you know, a wife having a child and they're not really, they don't even have to be there. Like the king isn't going to rush in, in a lot of cases to go see their child be born. It's just their next heir. There's a disconnection there. And so Rudius sort of sees Zenoba's perspective as that of like a king of royalty and not caring to see their child's birth and not have the necessity to be there all the time. But it's also this aspect of him basically telling Rudius, if you're afraid for the safety of Sylphie, don't worry. I'll be here. I'll keep her safe. I'll protect her. Rudius thought Sylphie wasn't on her own here. She had Aisha, Zenoba, and everybody around Princess Ariel. She wasn't alone. We weren't alone. You have people you can rely on. I think it's what he's kind of figuring out here. I have people that I can rely on. It's just, it, I'm not alone here. He weighed the options, feeling Zenoba's logic was sound. As long as Sylphie stayed healthy, everything would be fine. His presence wasn't going to make a difference. Still, that attitude didn't sit right with him. It was obviously better for Sylphie to have him providing emotional support. Sylphie did encourage him to go, telling him not to worry. But with it being her first pregnancy, she had to be terrified. She was probably fighting not to beg him to stay. Again, she's trying to be selfless here. The problem is that he was the one that told her he wanted to have kids over and over again. He may not have been serious about it at the time, but she took it seriously. Again, this is where I was talking about earlier and this idea that when he finally actually has the child, suddenly it shifts to he gets over emotion, which is so interesting to finally see because it always felt like a joke before. And now that she was actually pregnant, he was thinking of leaving her behind. It felt like a serious betrayal. But I think Sylphie understands this isn't just you going, ha <laughs> got a bun in the oven. Peace out, Sylphie. That's not what she's saying here. That's not the indication here. At the same time, he had to admit that he had been putting off his responsibility to help Paul, putting his happiness first for years. Hell, he even put his fixing his performance problem over searching for his mother. Oof. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> right in the gut. See? And people yelled at me for this. People, I, chat, <laughs> not all chat. I, I seen some people getting mad that I insinuated that. People were angry. I insinuated that Rudius put his fixing his problem before Zenith. The way that volume seven was wrote, I think was based on this line. When Edis left Rudius, he went to the north, depressed. He was looking to die. At the same time, the only driving purpose he was getting in his mind was, okay, well, I'll help dad find Zenith at least. But his primary focus was just, he was down. He was so broken and he was literally dying. 
then when Ellen and Elise showed up, she told him, we found her. They know where she's at. Okay, we'll go down and help. And then what happened? The man God showed up and the man God said, go to the university and you'll fix your ED. And guess what? Yes, partly based on Ellie saying, don't worry, they'll take care of it. Go to the university. Rudy still could have made a choice at that moment. Yeah, but what if something happens? I'm, I'm, let's go down there anyways. Let's go down there just in case something happens. We might pass them on the way, but we'll find out when we get there. Oh yeah, the Paul and them, they already left. They already found Zenith. We'll go back home. No, he chose at that point to go fix his ED. It's hard to say, and some people again got angry the last time I kind of insinuated this, but that's still the point. And Rudius himself acknowledges that. As hard as it is to acknowledge, it does produce a bit of heavy regret within yourself, but it's also more wrong to lie to yourself. You made a choice, fix it. Don't lie to yourself. This is one of the biggest gut punches in this chapter right here. Is it the acknowledgement from Rui's perspective, what everybody else sort of points out, whether misguided or not. Him himself, similar to what he did back with Paul. And it's so sad that he's, this is the second time he's done it. I was happy not realizing others were suffering. When he met Paul, he realized Paul was suffering because he was looking for my family and I was having fun. Again, there's a reason for that, acknowledging that, but Rudius himself acknowledges at that point, I screwed up, I was being happy. He was suffering and he's doing it again here. I found happiness. Paul is still suffering. Zenith is still in danger. And I was too busy trying to fix my ED. It's hard to realize at some point in your life when you realize that something you chose to do may have caused problems back here and it's been this long gap of time that you could have spent fixing it. It sucks. It's a massive regret. Maybe this was a wake up call. That said, he couldn't make up his mind. Both options would cost him greatly. Again, you're going to regret it. Everything will have a regret. I'm glad this is a big massive point for Rudius to realize whatever the man God says, if he ever puts regret at the end, say yeah. Either way, I'm gonna regret, right? <laughs> you gotta give me something else. Now on the fourth day, he spent most of it brooding over it. Not sleeping well or training, just sitting around the first floor, bleary eyed, doing nothing in particular. Suddenly, he found the front door opened with Norn standing in front of it. <laughs> it's like one of those moments where I almost want to tear up just because it makes me so happy. <laughs> I got a massive kick out of this whole segment right here. I love Norn. I have the last two chapters, three chapters. Gosh, I love this girl so much. He found the door, front door open with Norn standing in the front. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm smiling so much. I can't freaking talk, stupid Andrew. Norn standing in front of it. Large bag on her back. The same one that he had used in his days of adventuring. It was packed and bursting. Spending some time looking at her, she avoided his gaze. She looked like a kid that caught. He, she looked like a kid that got caught red-handed playing a prank. Where are you off to? She didn't answer. Where are you going, Norn? She bit her lip before looking him in the eyes. Well, if you're not gonna help, Rudius, I guess I'll go instead. This girl's like, no hesitation. Dad needs help. I'm going. <laughs> Dad needs help. I'm going. He thought, where? Beggar it? She was only 10. There was no way that bag had anything in it that she needed for that trip. Did she have any money or wits to spend wisely? What route would she take? How would she deal with the dangers? She could be kidnapped and sold as a slave. Norn, I can't let you do that. But I, I, Rudius, please. Mom and dad are in trouble. Why aren't you going to help them? Rudius thought of the reasons, obviously. Wife, his child. You're so much stronger than me, Rudius. You know how to travel. Why aren't you going? She wasn't wrong. He was experienced and could hold his own in a fight. As he was today, he could probably travel the demon continent without Rejur's help. Interesting note. <laughs> it was true. He could if he wanted to. He was weighing the pros and cons for days now, but that was because he could afford to choose. I know it's gonna go into talking about Nor in a minute, but I, it's one of those moments where you do realize that statement right there means so much but that was because he could choose. Can Paul choose right now? 
Can Geese choose right now? Can LLH choose right now? Can Zenith, can Zenith choose right now? Rudis is able to sit here and brood over it and think, which one do I do? Which one do I do? Because he has the option, they don't. And as he points out here specifically, he's not mentioning all them, Norn didn't have that choice. She wanted to help, but she couldn't. He could and had the ability to help their parents and make it back safely. That's why Geese sent him the letter and not someone else. That's why Rudius, that's why he sent it to Rudius. He didn't send it to Norn, didn't send it to anybody else, well, like Ellen at least, and maybe other people, but he sent it to Rudius because Rudius can help them. He needs Rudius. This isn't a send out the letter to whoever comes here. He needs Rudius. That's the realization point. Okay, Norn, you're right. Rudius, there was people who could look out for Sylphie, but he was the only one that could save his parents. Here, things are covered. Here, things are not. He could cut through the Begret continent to Rapan. He could solve the problems Paul and the others ran into. There wasn't anybody else that Rudius could trust for that job. I'll go. Can you look after the house for me? She lit up, but then squeezed her lips together, nodding with a serious expression. She wanted him to know, I got it. Okay, go. I'll handle it. Freaking love these two. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't fight with Aisha and help Silphy when you can, okay? Of course. All right. Good girl. He felt terrible doing this to Sylphie and their baby. If she dumped him, he wouldn't blame her. But that wasn't how he should be thinking about this. He needed to trust his wife. And so he made up his mind to save his parents. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this, is, this went on. I knew this was gonna be a long chapter to go through, but damn, um, this recording went on for way too long. I'm getting back to ba bad Andrew on recordings, but I wanted to do this. Um, such a crazy chapter. There's so much at the end here in this conflict that he's having. So much conflict. And I love how he fully sort of, as much as it frustrates me, because there is a side of me that has been sort of feeling that Rudius was neglecting the situation. I like that it finally has Rudius. He's done it before, but having Rudeus once again acknowledge the fact that he's sort of been avoiding something very serious happening with Zenith. And finally having that moment that he acknowledges it and still is technically conflicted. I'm fine with Rudeus having that conflict. He's finally found Sylphie and he's in love with Sylphie and he cares for Sylphie. And now he has a child. That's why I said that this is literally both of those things are important to this turning point. I think if Sylphie wasn't pregnant, I think it would make it easier for Rudeus to say, Sylphie, I'll be back. But because she's pregnant, it adds so much more difficulty in him making his decision. And I like the fact that he, he is trying to figure all that stuff out. At the same time, talking to different people about the situation to get their input. Granted, some of them are just more to just give Rudeus a nudge in the direction that things are going to be fine without you here. Don't worry about it. And at least the opposite in the idea of, no, just stay here. I'll handle it. Everything will be fine. But there there was a side of me that almost wanted Rudius to sort of think about the fact that Anna at least told you that before. So he he technically got technically at three perspectives. From Sylphie, it was go. Don't worry. But she was anxious. So she was a she was a neutral party. Zenoba was like, Go do it. Handle it. You're going to be fine. You're, you're Rudy. You're master. Master can handle this. So he was a nudge in the direction of just go. El Elise was the nudge in the direction of don't go. But curious that he didn't say, but you told me that before. And now I got this letter. Uh, it's super interesting. But I think the thing that I have to admit, I have to admit, I, I've been actually talking about this for a while. So this isn't going to be something that's going to shock people. For that are on the chat. It's not going to shock anybody that's been watching Mystical Mondays. This has me excited. I am extremely excited for this. And, I, and I'm and i having that feeling going into chapter 8 as well. The story has sort of gotten to a sticking point. And I think I finally understand now what everybody kind of mentioned. The idea that before I got to this area with the university and everything. 
a lot of people warn that this is like for some people kind of a stale point of the, the series. And I sort of understand now looking back because now I feel like things are going to be going forward because now I feel excited. I am feeling this re-spark excitement for the story and where it's going to go. I have loved these chapters, don't get me wrong, for these characters and the developments and what all Rudeus has had happen to him and and Zenoba and Cliff and Sylphie and Rajard coming back and Aisha, Norn, my gosh, Norn's chapters. Everything has been fantastic. Body Gotti. I love all these characters. I love the introduction of the characters. I love all the insights and the summoning and magics and all this kind of stuff that's been like juicy deets that I love. But I miss the adventure. And I don't know if that's what everybody was kind of, you know, feeling like this was stale for is because there's a lack of adventure. But I miss the adventure. From the very beginning of the series, it starts, it opens up in this cold state, obviously, with Rudeus appearing in this world, meeting Roxy. But then very quickly, go to Edis. Adventure. Off to meet Edis. With Edis for a little bit, it stays put for a couple minutes, and then boom. Displacement incident, adventure, traveling, adventure, 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 all the way up here, adventure, adventure, and then Edis parts ways with him, and he goes, boof. There was still a little bit of adventure in Seven, but it just stops. It just stops. The adventure stops. And it's fine because we're seeing Rudius grow outside of adventuring. He's growing as a person and getting a life. But still, there is a side of me that's like, I miss it. I miss going out, meeting people and the world itself and exploring and seeing sights and crazy stuff happening. It's been sort of stale, despite the character developments that have been happening. And there's an also a side of me that's like, we're finally going to go find out what the hell's happening in the freaking Begrick continent because that's literally been in my gut ever since Roxy was with Kishirika, and Kishirika said, send us over here. It's been twisting my gut ever since then. Five full volumes, I've been dreading what's happening with Zenith. And we're finally going to hopefully have that go down there and find out. And I hope, and I know it's probably gonna be like, careful what you wish for, boy. <laughs> you asked for it. Ugh. I'm excited. And like I said, I'm just like, the entire time reading chapter eight so far, I'm just like, yes, 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 let's go, 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 let's go. Again, fully acknowledging, sucks the idea of he's not going to be back in time for Selfie. Now, literally, he has somebody in this university that knows how to get to places really quick. I don't know that she'll divulge it, but I'm thinking that he will have a quick way of getting there and back. And so he could still see the birth of his child if he can find, if Nanahoshi can give him information on a teleport and that get in there quicker. Will that be enough time? Don't know. Don't know where the teleports are and you still need to probably travel quite a bit, but we'll see. But that's my theory on the idea that I don't feel like he's going to miss out on Sylvie, but I'm still dreading what he's going to find when he gets there. Because again, I'm fearing for Paul right now. Again, chat. <laughs> He's either incapacitated, really messed up, or something worse, and I, I'm dreading it. I'm tempted right now to just read the rest of this volume and into 12 because I know people are probably spoiling right now. I am really happy that Norn at this point is comfortable enough with Rudius to at least speak her mind because there's so much that I want to know what's going through Norn's mind at this moment because you know this whole time that Rudius has been sort of struggling with what decision he wants to make. She has been struggling probably internally with the initial impression that she has of Rudius that you won't help mom and dad. Why aren't you helping mom and dad? That's what was in her chapter. She was struggling with that. And yes, she does at some point acknowledge the idea that she's sort of in the same doesn't say it, but like I kind of mentioned in the last Mystical Mondays, it sort of implies that idea that she's going down the same route that, that her father did with Rudius, and the idea that you're having fun here and everybody's suffering. Why aren't you helping people? And so for her and anybody, she's probably struggling right now, it's like, you got a letter that says he's in trouble. 
why aren't you going to help dad and mom? Like, what is what is your problem here? And instead of criticizing him, she just went. I like that. Again, I love Norn so much. I've grown to love her so much. And this is that moment where you see, despite the fact, despite, she's not a genius like Aisha. She's not a genius like Rudius. But she'll go. Because their family needs them. And again, she won't outright say it until he confronts her. But she in her mind, I think, is thinking, I, I don't want to do this, but I, I'm going to do this instead. I can't criticize him. I don't want to criticize him, but I'm going to go. Okay, now he's asking me what I'm doing. Criticize him. Why aren't you helping? You can do this. Why aren't you helping? And again, I love so much how it puts it in that geese sent a letter to me, not anybody else. They need me. I can't trust anybody else for this. I have to go. I have my conflicts. I'm still hurting that I'm doing this to Sylphie, but I have to do this. But you no, know, it's kind of, kind of what it really is to be like, I could really use Rajard's help for the situation. There's somebody I can rely on. Hey, Norn, go outside and scream help. I'm a child in need of help. And maybe Rajard will pop up out of nowhere. Rajard's still hopefully nearby that he can hear it. Hopefully, I don't know, probably too far away at this point, but good stuff. Good chapter. Holy crap. I'm super excited for what's to come. Um, as per usual, thanks guys so much for dropping by for the premiere. It was a great set of chapters. I am so excited to start jumping into the following chapters. The next few weeks, or I don't know, maybe the next year of Mushuko Mondays are going to be insane. Uh, based on what everybody can't shut up about, <laughs> it seems like things are going to get crazy from here on out. So... Super excited for it. Cannot wait. Um, man, I, I'm pumped. I'm absolutely pumped. I'm super into this. But anyways, gush, 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 gush. Thanks, guys, so much for dropping by the premiere. I'm, again, of course, dropping at this point. I've, my recordings are going on long. I'm totally going to get into a two-hour long Mishoko Monday, and I don't want to do that again, but I'm doing it anyways. Just, it happened, unfortunately. I, I was kind of thinking last week that I might just go ahead and put seven as its own thing, but... Eight, six was way too short. I mean, it was still technically long, but I hope you guys enjoy it either way. But uh, again, thanks guys so much for dropping by the premiere. Everybody that supports the channel, all the people that are hitting the like button, make sure to hit the like button before you leave here. Um, all those that support the channel by telling other people about it, those that support by just saying kind words, I, I appreciate that stuff so much. It means so much to me, as usual. I want to keep saying that. Um, I, I know it might be repetitive for some people for me thanking people every single Mushoko Mondays. But that, I just want to make sure that everybody understands every week, and especially for those that are new, that stuff means a lot. It keeps us going. It keeps me invigorated. It makes this all very rewarding for me. Um, but again, especially thanks to those that support monetarily through our Patreon um, tips link, those that are members of the channel itself, greatly appreciate you guys' hard-earned money going to support this so that I can keep doing this stuff. Um, you guys are amazing. I can't express enough that that stuff means so much to me. With that said, until the next Mushoko Mondays, you all take care. But reading it made him vividly, but reading it, but reading it made him vividly, remember, Brute, she didn't strike him, she didn't, after chatting about the seeds that she'd get, Reese was, what, Reese was curious if there was any seeds that, and yes, in that is what we'll find out later. She actually, and yes, in this, and we'll find out, so, yes, and in this, essentially, it forces the extreme, essentially, it forces the external mana, essentially, it, essentially, it, it was a simple, th it was a simple, th lamplights, it was a summoning, it was a summoning school. Fiends were hard to control, unless you had the pro, fiends were hard to, con and then finally, return a summon, li and then summon a living, and then summon a living thing, to this previous location. Summon an inorganic, uh, summon an inor, summon an, summon an inorganic, summon, summon an inorganic, summon an inorganic, oh my gosh, dude. Summon an inorganic, but she laid it out as the following. But she laid it out, but the, pl but her step-by-step -step plan was, first, summon an inor, he was afraid she had, she, he began to be afraid that she would, meaning that, meaning that if you say that, meaning that, meaning the idea of even hinting, meaning the idea that even, meaning saying something, so merely saying that, oh well, 
You're so, but yeah, she pressed her hands together in a pleading gesture. But yeah, she pressed, but yeah, she pressed her hands together in a pleading gesture. You're okay with me selling copying? You're okay with me selling copies? Won't the guy? From that day on, Rodius would start, from that day on, Rodius would start helping Cliff experiment. The, but yeah, from that day on, Rodius started to help. But yeah, that day, but yeah, from that day on, Rodius started, but yeah, that day, but yeah, from that day on, Rudius started helping Cliff's experiments. But yeah, that, and I think that's everybody that reads Mushoku Mondays. Well, well, if you're not going to, if you're not going to help, well, if you're not going to get, I would have, I would, I would have, I would of course prefer to have you at my side constantly. I would, up, I would of course prefer to have you at my side constantly. Which, with such a long journey, he would not be able to get home in time. And with such a long journey, he wouldn't make it back to time. With such a... Again, it's kind of going back to the whole thing. He didn't lie by saying, you will regret it. Are you going, Ellen Elise? Are you going to go, Ellen? Are you going to go, Ellen Elise? Are you going to go, Ellen Elise? But no, he flatly reduced... I did. I said it again, flatly reduced. I said that last time, <laughs> flatly reduced.